All right, everyone. All right, so uh, we have Sean Dunn with us tonight who is the Natural Heritage Program Zoologist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And even though Sean doesn't really focus exclusively on insects, maybe he wishes he does, um, he does a lot of things with small mammals and he does our herps, so our reptiles and amphibians as well. And we'll let him kind of talk a little bit more about what he does. Um, but really invertebrates just don't get a lot of love if you think about it. Um, they're very accessible. Um, if you walk outside your door, I'm sure you could find an invertebrate very easily. Um, and if you're not sure what an invertebrate is, other than it doesn't possess a backbone, we're going to talk about that tonight. So, um, so like I mentioned, we're going to talk to Sean Dunn. He's going to be our expert panelist tonight. And Sean, what kind of got you into the world of invertebrates? Um, you are kind of my go-to person if I have a bug question or a um, wasp question, or I found this insect, it's in a plastic bag in our freezer. Can you please identify it? Um, so how did you really get into the world of being like an invertebrate nerd? You know, I, it's, it's funny that you mentioned like there's, a, there's an invertebrate um, in our freezer in a bag because there's quite a few in my freezer upstairs and um, my wife does not appreciate that at all times. <laughs> so when she opens the freezer and there's a bunch of bags of insects, she gets pretty upset. But I try to keep those to a minimum, try to get them identified to figure out what they are. But I think that's what initially drew me to invertebrates. You know, uh, growing up, you know, the, the vertebrates are the cool ones. There's, you know, lots of manuals, you know, bird ID and, and reptiles and amphibians and mammals and all of these different things that you can see. But when you get into the insects, there's so much out there and you can find them everywhere. I mean, it's, you go out at night and they're all over your house and your windows, wherever lights are. You go out during the day, you pick up a log underneath a rock, just swarming around you if you walk out you know you go to a wet area and you get all sorts of larvae and things swimming around in the water that are going to go through metamorphosis and come out as something else and each of those has you know hundreds of species each of those little groups i just mentioned you know and it's so much that I like learning new stuff. I get excited about new things. And I think that's what initially drew me in when I took entomology. It just kind of opened this world of all sorts of stuff that I didn't know about. And I was really excited to learn about. And while you graciously call me an expert, I am, I feel that I'm far from an expert because I'm always learning about this stuff. I'm always finding out something new. Um, you know, whether that's from the experts that are publishing peer-reviewed scientific journal papers, or it's from someone on iNaturalist that just happened to see an insect, they posted it, and I see it, I say, hey, where did you find that? That's amazing. We haven't seen that in the state. So um, it, it's one of those things I just love to learn all these, all these different things, and that's what really drives me. That's cool that you mentioned some of those words, um, things like swarm or hundreds or they're at your house. Um, sometimes a lot of people don't like the word swarm or around you like they, they don't really spark like that sexy appearance. I mean, not to everybody. There are right? some people that absolutely yeah. think that, you know, like a cool rhinoceros beetle is like the sexiest thing out there. And I, I, I really admit that they're very cool. Um, but like when we talk about those things, we said that they're very accessible. And is it true that about 90, 95% of all species on earth are in fact invertebrates? Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it, so we've got you know, things that have a backbone. You've got your birds, you've got your herps, you've got your mammals, and then you've got some uh, cartilaginous fish that have, you know, uh, a backbone. But beyond that, I mean, everything else basically doesn't have that. So all of your, you know, think of all the jellyfish in the ocean, uh, all of those little tiny, uh, you know, tiny, tiny things that uh, swim throughout the ocean that we don't even know about necessarily. Think about like crabs and lobsters, you know, those are kind of like insects of the ocean. Then you come on land and, you know, we've got insects, we've got bacteria, we've got all these other groups that don't have a vertebrae or a backbone. And 
you are, yeah, the, the amount of diversity and the number of species and, and the number of individuals of each of those species is just astronomical. It's amazing. And when you mention all the diversity that we have, I mean, you mentioned things that are legless invertebrates or things that are mm -hmm. segmented or animals that are wingless or animals that, that are water dwelling. So all these invertebrates have so many cool habitats and places that they can um, be. And one, uh, unfortunately, the person that was going to talk tonight about our mussels um, in Nebraska, we have quite a few mussels, about 30 mm -hmm. species or so that have been, um, I think, found in Nebraska. Uh, that's a whole nother their group, that bivalve group that we often forget that Nebraska isn't really known for, um, but we wow. have quite a few of them. So such a rich diversity and lots of habitat. So um, thinking about those diversities and all those different types that we mentioned, they still are under one group of invertebrates. So what mm -hmm. makes invertebrates like so special or those traits that make them invertebrates? Clearly well, they know, don't have a backbone, but like. <laughs> right. And that's, I think, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, a backbone, while it's really helpful, you know, it sends, it's this nervous highway. So it's for all your nerves that will go right up your brain and right to your brain. And there are rudimentary versions of that in some of, you know, the, um, some invertebrates have, you know, that kind of thing, but it's not protected by that spinal column, that vertebrae, those bones that we see uh, in species that have vertebrae. But I think, you know, those we consider to see kind of on the end of the evolutionary spectrum, but everything else has found a different way of adapting. So they have different ways of sending messages throughout their body. And it tends to be something like uh, a nervous system that you know branches out, but it's certainly not as efficient nor as protected as we see in uh, the vertebrates. And so to be able to do that, you've just got this huge array of different things um, that are out there in nature. And oh man, it's just, it's so fun to explore them. It's interesting that you mentioned they just have different methods of because oftentimes I feel like people place them on a animals on kind of like a linear scale where humans are, you know, way over here, we mm -hmm. were more superior, we have higher, bigger brains, we have good eyesight, that kind of stuff. And people usually place invertebrates like way down at the end or end of the scale. Um, right. So do they have to overcompensate since they don't have um, a backbone? Or is there sometimes that things that are difficult? for them to well, do since they don't have one? You know, one of the things, the, the way to think about it, you know, we used to, we used to call uh, things without, uh, you know, a backbone, we used to call those like ancestral, you know, those are ancestral species, you know, they haven't evolved like we have, obviously, but it's not really it. They're actually quite well adapted to what they do. So, um, so let's, let's talk about muscles real quick, if we can jump to that, because I think they're a, a, a perfect specimen uh, to talk about this. So freshwater mussels, which you mentioned, we have many species here in Nebraska. Uh, those are those when you look through a river sometime in certain ponds that are connected to rivers, what some people call like freshwater clams. So you've got uh, two shells, sometimes thin, sometimes very thick. And they open up and there's, you know, what looks like a bunch of goo inside, but it's actually fairly well organized. Um, and Nebraska, a couple of years ago, we started breeding these so that we could uh, raise up species that are endangered or um, potential to become endangered and then release them back into the wild to help our native populations. So to do that, we had to know a lot about those species of mussels. Now, something that a lot of people don't know about mussels is that their young, their babies, if you will, are actually paras parasitic. So they're parasites. They call them glochidia. So after uh, a mussel is fertilized uh, and the young uh, kind of develop, they're kind of shot out into the water and they have to find a fish host. And some species have many different fish hosts. They'll, they'll connect onto you know, bass or carp or whatever it may be. Others, they need only one species that they have to find. 
And so that may be a freshwater drum or a trout or something like that. And they release these glochidia and they will attach to the gills of the fish. So they actually kind of get in the gills and they attach there and then they siphon off some of the stuff that the fish is eating and also some of the um, parts of the fish itself sometimes and they start growing. Then once they get big enough, they'll drop off the fish and they'll bury into the substrate. And from there they start growing and they kind of look like what we traditionally think of as a freshwater mussel, a bivalve. Um, bivalve just means two sides. Um, and so from all of that, I would say that species, even though it may not seem as advanced as a vertebrate, it's really well adapted at doing what it needs to do. So it can go out into the stream, attach to a fish, get into the substrate and start filter feeding to help clean up the water and eat all the stuff that flows through there. So, I mean, really well adapted species, even though it, you open it up, it just looks like a pile of goo to most people. And what a cool like adaptation, like who would have ever thought that a muscle, because I didn't know that when I first started, I only learned this like two years ago, that yeah. they do attach to the gills of a fish and like what a great life cycle and how smart is that? So even though, like you said, they're sometimes not called advanced, there's those ancestral animals. Mm -hmm. Wow, like <laughs> look what they can do. Um, and in Nebraska, we're doing, is it the scale shell muscle? And is it Plains Pocketbook? Is that the ones that we're focusing on right yes, now? Yes, I believe okay. so right now. Yeah, we just started a, a couple other species, but um, a lot of the mussel um, raising that people do in labs is actually down in like the southeast part of the U.S. Um, Missouri does some and, and a few other states close to us. But our fisheries biologists actually had to travel around and look how some other states were doing this because they were like, we're really interested in doing this. We really think it's going to help out our waters and our streams. How can we do this? And um, I think we've got some really cool videos on our website about uh, showing like how the mussels bring fish closer so that they can put out their babies, the glochidia, um, to then attach to the fish host and all sorts of, it's really, really fascinating. If you've never looked at the biology of mussels, you totally should. It's so cool. Yeah. And they're actually, um, in our evaluation that we will send out to all of our participants, we will link um, a few of those articles and videos that Sean yeah. was mentioning so that you guys can see um, some photos and actually up close about how this process looks. So we will definitely send those to all of you too. Yeah. And if you look around, you can find there's a guide to like freshwater mussels of the Midwest and uh, mussels of Nebraska. And they, um, those are so cool because you know, when you start looking around at the different mussels, a lot of them kind of look similar until you really start looking at the structures and noticing those differences. And then, oh man, it's kind of like the insects. I mean, it just, the world opens up to seeing all the differences. It's really, really cool. And I think you've mentioned that too, about identifying insects. Sometimes it's very difficult because there's only like one vein of a wing that determines between this species and this species or a stripe or a very, very small mm -hmm. detail. Um, why is that? Why isn't it like a mammal? Like I can clearly tell an elephant from a beaver. Why is right. it not that easy? Yeah. So, I mean, well, I think it comes partly from the, the diversity or the species richness that they're, that we're finding. Um, and, you know, I'll say part of it is we're actually finding more now uh, because we're able to tell the difference and we've got people working on them. You know, unfortunately, there's so many insects out there and there's not as many um, entomologists and experts that focus on certain groups. And so um, I've worked mostly with beetles, um, which is a very large group. Uh, the few groups that I've worked with are, are fairly well known, um, but yeah, there's, there's so many other groups that when I get something that I'm not sure about, I usually have to call somebody else and I'm like, hey, I've got this narrowed down to maybe the genus and I have no idea where to go from here. And they'll say, oh yeah, the key for that was done back in like 1920 something. And <laughs> so it's, it hasn't been revised since. So, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to see what it is. 
But I think it's just because the simple fact that there's so much out there and we're trying to catch up to be able to tell the differences. Like one good um, example. So um, some work I had done years ago, I had caught these beetles and I had like 30 of them and they, um, they were fairly simple to tell apart. I was like, okay, this is the species, no problem. I happened to come across a paper that said, actually, there are two different species. And the way you tell the difference is you have to zoom in with a microscope on the head. And if the head has little punctures in it, so little divots all around it, it belongs to this one species. If it doesn't and it's nice and smooth, it belongs to another species. And they were actually able to look at these two different species and notice that they had differences in um, mating structures, in how they mated and timing. And all of that made it clear that they were different species. And they just happened to see that also this one also had a bunch of punctures on the head. Huh. So now we know that those two are, are completely different species. That's crazy. So what you're saying is that we just need more entomologists out there to study yes. and key yes. and ID things. Okay. Even, even like, and you don't even have to like have a bunch of fancy degrees for this. Like if you just dive into it, like I know many people that, you know, are just do this as a hobby to identify species. And I will call them and say, hey, you're the expert on this. Can you tell me what this species is? And, you know, they've been looking in their backyard or the, the prairies in their area. They know. And yeah. it's, it's fantastic. So if, if you need a new hobby, please get into entomology. Give me a call. I'll tell you what groups we need to have covered for the state. Um, you mentioned iNaturalist earlier, which is another resource that we can certainly email our participants, um, mm -hmm. but that is a great way for people to not only figure out what they're looking at, but like you said, just be more observant and finding these different things because uh, scientists can't be everywhere at once. And so we yeah. need those community scientists, um, everyone, public people to go out there and find these things and get that data for people like Sean. So yes, we can definitely... Um, show some of that in the evaluations that we send you as well, so. Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I, am, I am not, in the beginning, I was not a fan of iNaturalist. I didn't understand it. I, I was slow to, it, to grow to it, but um, we have, you know, a lot of people are using it now. We have a wonderful um, community scientist at, at mm -hmm. uh, Game and Parks, and she has really been helping me with it. And it's amazing the amount of data and, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, people that just do this for a hobby or just do this for fun, man, they know so much more than me about certain groups. And it's just incredible to see the amount of data and expertise that yeah. is on iNaturalist. So I, I, again, if you have any interest in the outside world, get on iNaturalist. It's, it's really cool. And there's a lot of different projects and different types mm -hmm. of things you can look at too. If you want to just focus on lady beetles, there's a whole project just on lady beetles or butterflies or pollinators. Right now it's pollinator week um, and yeah. we have our pollinator challenge going on. So if you're interested in that iNaturalist, um, I can also send you some more information about pollinators um, and doing that pollinator challenge, basically going out and finding pollinators in your park or backyard or your area and um, helping people identify what they are through that iNaturalist app too. So another great thing to talk about. Yeah. You know, like Three years ago, we planted part of our front yard with a, a pollinator mix here in Lincoln. And um, I mean, we just have all sorts of flowers popping up now and even ones coming up now that we didn't see the first couple of years. And the number of pollinators that come to our front yard now is just incredible. It's yeah. so awesome. Like, you know, bees and flies and bumblebees and beetles and all sorts of stuff and, and um, obviously butterflies and moths, all of these things that we kind of knew were in the area. Now they're on like this, you know, 20 foot stretch of my driveway right next to it. And my kids love going out there and exploring those and seeing different things. So um, it's really easy, even in the cities to plant a little patch of something and get a big payback, a big payoff from that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so you kind of led into my next question, but what are some of the really, um, not necessarily common invertebrates, but what are some invertebrates mm. that we might see in Nebraska? Um, tonight, we were going to have someone focus on spiders, someone focus on mussels, and then Sean kind of was our, like our catch-all for insects. <laughs> but um, what are some specific invertebrates that we might see maybe commonly or maybe some not so common species in Nebraska? Yeah, so... I mean, beetles, there's always going to be lots of beetles. Um, beetles and wasps are the two biggest groups. You know, it used to be there's that famous quote about, um, let me see if I can get it right. You know, someone asked, um, you know, what, what, what's the most specious group or something, or what does uh, the creator think about uh, the world? And it was that he has an inordinate fondness for beetles. And that's because beetles were there are so many different species recently though we found out that um there's likely more wasps than oh, there are beetles i would not and, have said wasps huh yeah and that's because there's a lot of wasps that they prey um on other species of wasps and they in turn have other parasite wasps that will prey on them and a lot of them are really, really tiny and they're really hard to catch. They're really hard to find. They're really hard to see and identify. And so again, there weren't many specialists in these groups. Now there are uh, some more people looking at those groups and they're thinking, uh, and they're called parasitoid wasps, by the way. Um, they're finding that there's actually more species of those they believe than there are beetles. It's huh. really hard to get a like a consistent count of any one group because we're constantly finding new species. We're constantly re realizing that what we thought was one species is actually three or four. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's one of those things in genetics is helping us determine that too. So you can look at genetics of a species and while they may look similar, um, they're actually very different genetically. So we know they're probably different species, but um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of different things that we can be looking at to, to look at those differences. I kind of got off track there. What was your question? Um, just what are some like common species that we have in Nebraska or maybe some not so common ones? Okay, we, okay. You know, you mentioned so, yeah. wasps and I, mm -hmm. for tomorrow, for our Facebook post, I did a, um, I can't remember that it's a black long tail wasp, the one with the long ovipositor. Oh. That looks, like really wispy. Um, like a like does it have real thin and then it's got like a bulb at the end almost yeah and the long like wispy tail it's a large black and starts with an eye oh. it's a long bird wasp <laughs> yeah uh, um, it's an ichneumonid that one, one yeah oh, okay this yeah is my year so the expert, there's so yeah there's ichneumonid wasps which are a, a pretty large group but yeah there's one yeah now I know what you're talking about there's one that actually has this really long ovipositor that it puts into a uh, bark of trees. Yeah, it will like bore into the wood to lay its mm -hmm. eggs so that the larva then will grow up and eat the other, like you said, that parasitoid wasp group. Yeah, I just and it's really cool. That. Yeah, I'm going to look for that because there's always cool pictures of like them putting that ovipositor into the tree and it's really cool the way you can kind of see it at first you're like, gross, what is that? But yeah, when you understand what's going on, like it's really cool. Um, so those are, are a common species that you can see sometimes. You know, we hear a lot these days about monarch butterflies. The monarchs come right through um, Nebraska, so we see lots of those. Uh, silver spotted skippers are a really common um, skipper, which is a type of butterfly that we'll see. Um, lots and lots of moths, um, lace wings. You know, there's uh, all sorts of things. Turn on your light at night, you know, your porch light or something go out there and just look at the various number of stuff out there. I mean, it's incredible what you'll, what you'll see. And then we also do have some really rare species, a couple that are endangered, the American Bering beetle, uh, the Salt Creek tiger beetle. Um, and then we've got some others that aren't necessarily endangered or threatened, but they aren't necessarily as, um, as uh, abundant. And those are things that are usually uh, water, uh, need certain fresh water, uh, much like our mussels, uh, their uh, water's been degraded or it's been drained or somewhere else. And the numbers have gone down. We see that a lot with aquatic species. 
And then also the other group I'd say that we see um, the numbers have gone down um, would be our caddis flies, which are also dependent on water a lot of times. Their numbers uh, we haven't seen quite as much. Hmm. That's interesting that I, I guess I knew of the Platte River caddis fly, but I right. didn't think about yeah. the other ones being huh, mm -hmm. interesting. So yeah, um, and we have seen decreases in, in some butterfly species. We're actually doing, um, we have a pollinator biologist in the um, uh, wildlife division who's going out and doing surveys for a lot of our uh, lepidopterans, our, our moths and butterflies. Um, to see where we're at on a lot of our, our populations because a lot of those need very specific prairie flowers to uh, feed on and lay their eggs on. And without high quality, high diversity prairies, it's really hard for those butterflies to uh, feed and lay their eggs. And so we've seen a decline in a lot of those as well. Mm. That's too bad. Um, thinking about their life strategy, and I know this is going to be a really hard question because all of them are different depending on mm -hmm. where they live. Is there anyone that stands out in your mind as like a really cool way that they reproduce or their life cycle is very unique? I know with invertebrates, you're going to have that, some, whatever people call it, incomplete versus complete metamorphosis where one has four stages versus one has three stages. Mm -hmm. um, what are some cool ways that they reproduce? Like the parasoid, parasitoid wasps, like that's really neat. Yeah, Anything so, else that sticks out? Yeah, I mean, like I always like talking about freshwater mussels with their glochidia and coming out, like just, just Google glochidia one day, everybody. <laughs> like it's really cool to see like, you know, not... We don't actually have video, maybe someone does, but, um, but just seeing like the different fish and how they clamp onto the gills and everything, it's super fascinating. I'm also really fascinated by parasites. So that's probably part of it. But so the parasitoid wasp, depending on what species, because again, there's a whole lot of species and they almost all do different things. But like, for instance, um, a lot of times we see pictures of caterpillars and they will have these little like, uh, they almost look like white thumbs sticking out all over them. And those are actually parasitoid wasp eggs that are attached to the caterpillar. Oh, and that's what those so, are? Huh. Yeah. And okay. so what those are going to do is they're going to hatch and they're going to eat that caterpillar. And then from there, they're going to go out and mate, lay their own eggs and the cycle goes all over again. But that's actually fairly common for these parasitoid wasps. They will lay their eggs in either like a tree and then those uh, young will find their way to other species inside the tree or they'll actually lay their eggs or young directly inside a caterpillar or another insect. Then when it hatches, it will basically eat that insect from the inside hmm. and then pop out and go find a mate and the cycle starts all over again. It's kind of gruesome in a way, but really fascinating when you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint. And you mentioned the metamorphosis. So there's complete metamorphosis where you've got, like a butterfly is a really good example. You've got this sluggish worm looking thing that gets bigger as it eats, goes into a cocoon, and then it comes out of something completely different. So complete metamorphosis, it changes from one thing to the next. Then you've got something that's called incomplete metamorphosis where it kind of looks like what it's going to be as an adult the whole time and it just kind of goes through different stages. Um, and so like a uh, grasshopper, uh, that's a, a good example where the nymphs look fairly similar but they don't have wings or their legs aren't quite uh, the size they should be when they're an adult. And so again, with a lot of different species, you have a lot of different life strategies to do all of this stuff. Why do some like, like what ad advantage is there for a grasshopper to not have complete metamorphosis or like the opposite way around? Like, is there, or do we know why that mm. is? I'm sure there, I'm sure there's papers on this. Let me think about this for a minute. So <laughs> sorry to stump you. Um, no, that's okay. So I think it has to do a lot with, uh, you know, it, if I were to think about it, it would have to do a lot with uh, your food source. So a grasshopper is always going to be 
where there's grass available. So they're gonna have those chewing mouth parts from when they're a tiny little nymph all the way up to an adult. And that food is available for them. But for a caterpillar, um, you know, they've got a lot of grass and greenery to eat on. But then when they become an adult, some moths and butterflies actually don't feed at all when they are an adult. Their only purpose is to mate and lay eggs. And uh, if it's a male, it may mate several times and then die. The female will lay her eggs and then she'll die. Um, however, some of them do feed as adults and they switch from eating vegetation to nectar. And so they've got a whole life strategy then to switch to a whole nother uh, food source that may not be utilized as much, much easier to find. Also, um, I would say when you go through complete metamorphosis, you're fairly vulnerable to being eaten. So you're wrapped up in a cocoon or chrysalis or something, and you're just kind of sitting there. You're basically a tasty snack for anything that uh, eats your size of food. So um, it's kind of makes you vulnerable, but once you pop out of that, you are able to have a whole new food source. I mean, that's a good way to think about it, I guess. Yeah, I, did, yeah, I wasn't sure, certain why that was, why they did that. So, huh. I would okay. say that would that would definitely be some advantages. Now, I, I'd be happy to go toe to toe at the bar one night with somebody over that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we kind of talked a little bit now about what is interest or what invertebrates are, and kind of which ones we have in Nebraska, and a little bit about their their life history and their life strategies. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about some of the research that's happening with our invertebrates. And Sean, yeah. I know you do quite a bit of research, um, specifically sometimes. I know you mentioned this little beetle called the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle. Um, yeah. If you're not familiar with the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it is endemic and found in two counties um, in Nebraska. Sean, what'd you say? Originally. Oh, is it changed now? Well, it's no longer found in Saunders. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. So endemic simply means that it is found here in a certain area and only that area in the world. Um, so our Salt Creek Tiger Beetle, if you're familiar with Lancaster County, we have these really cool areas called the saline wetlands with the saline simply meaning like salty. Um, and they're found in this area. So um, they're uh, endangered is up there, threatened or endangered species. I can't remember which status they are. They, but... Yep, they are uh, endangered at the state okay. level and federal level. Okay, state and federally listed as an endangered species. Um, so talking a little bit about um, maybe the research that's happening with them. Um, you know, how did you how did you get on about the Salt Creek Tiger Beetles or when Nebraska Game and Parks started doing this project, how did they determine that this is a species that is in um, a desperate need of research and what do we do um, and how do you find them? They're really small. Yeah, I could, I could talk all hour about this. So you're gonna have to rein me in at some point. Okay, but I can rein you Salt Creek Tiger Beetle, yeah, I, I love working on this. Um, it's a really cool species. Um, and a lot of people will ask me right away, they're like, why this beetle? Why is it important? Like, it's just a little beetle, right? There's plenty of others. Um, but the Salt Creek tiger beetle, uh, first let's talk about the saline wetlands. So the saline wetlands, it is really rare to find an inland, uh, saline wetlands that aren't connected to the coast somehow. So here in the middle of the Great Plains, we have this amazing set of wetlands situated around Lincoln, which is why Lincoln was founded here because of the salt. Um, and within that, I mean, these wetlands are used for all sorts of things. Uh, migratory birds come through here. We have unique plants that, that live in there um, that are found only in that area. Um, and not only that, but all the insects. And we've actually, uh, one researcher, he has documented over 600 different insects that occur just within our saline wetlands. 600? Yeah, over wow. 600 just within the saline wetlands. And, and it's not, you know, you think saline wetlands, like we're grouping them all together. 
they're very different. I mean, there are ones that run along Little Salt Creek uh, into Salt Creek and also Rock Creek, which is Rock Creek's a little bit further to the east. And that's the one that runs up into Saunders County. That's where the population of Salt Creek tiger beetles used to be uh, attached to Rock Creek, but that, that population is no longer there. Um, the only populations we do have left are along Little Salt Creek and Salt Creek, uh, just in and around uh, North and in Lincoln. So, um, so as part of that, uh, way back in, I say way back, but um, back in the 90s, we started uh, a researcher at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Steve Spomer, uh, started noticing that there weren't a lot of these beetles. And there's, there's several different species. There's about a dozen different tiger beetle species that occur within our saline wetlands. And he started noticing that the Salt Creek tiger beetle, there wasn't the numbers that there used to be. And we actually can go back and look at uh, our museum collection at UNL, uh, at Shadron, at Kearney. We can go down to KU in Kansas and, and all across the country and find uh, in museums, Salt Creek tiger beetles. And we noticed that back in the 20s and 30s, there were plenty being collected, not a big deal. Um, but then as Steve started doing uh, surveys for him, he noticed their numbers were really low. So he brought it to our attention. We started doing, we set up and said, okay, we really need to start looking at this every year. So we started doing annual surveys. Uh, then we uh, listed it as endangered in our state. And then uh, we also brought it to the attention of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And they started looking at the numbers, doing their own surveys, confirming our numbers, and they also listed it as endangered. And so from there, we came up with a recovery plan to say, okay, we know their numbers are low, what can we do to reverse that? Um, and again, why should we save this beetle? Not only is it really cool, but also the Salt Creek tiger beetle is kind of like this bellwether. It lets us know when our saline wetlands are in good shape, of good quality. So if we want to know, like, you know, we can go out and say, this is a saline wetland, it looks really good. You know, there's lots of different plants here and all of that. But, you know, there are certain species that are gonna be there when it really is a high quality uh, saline wetland. And the Salt Creek tiger beetle is one of those. And so um, ever since about 2011, we've been uh, lab rearing the beetles. So we raised them in labs, Henry Dorley Zoo, Lincoln Children's Zoo, University of Nebraska Lincoln. And about three years ago, uh, Topeka Zoo down in Topeka, Kansas also helps us raise uh, Salt Creek tiger beetles. Um, and then we put them back out into the wild um, and Actually this week, starting uh, last week, but into this week and maybe part of next week, I'm actually doing the annual surveys right now. So how do you do a survey on a Salt Creek tiger beetle? Because every time that I see you, you're like, it's too cloudy, it's too cold right. out. And it was like 95 and you're like, it's too cold, right? it needs to be warmer. <laughs> so like, why, what do you do to, to find these animals? We're like the perfect conditions here. Yeah, so they're, they're kind of unique. They really like, bright sunny conditions and they are well adapted to the heat. A lot of the other tiger beetle species out in our saline wetlands, um, they're moving around during the day somewhat, but they also like to use the shade a lot. Uh, they'll hide in plants quite a bit. Only when you get near them, they'll kind of flush out and move around. Salt Creek tiger beetles, they are out when it's nice and sunny and really, really hot and they don't run for the shade very much. They cool off by drinking water. So usually we're almost always gonna find them by water. And so that's again, one of the life strategies that are different even among these closely related species that live in the same area. So most of the species will stay hidden during the day. They'll kind of move around in the vegetation. Salt Creek tiger beetle uh, is out on the kind of uh, sandy mud flats uh, that are in these saline wetlands. And they will just drink water to stay cool. And so they can be out when it's really hot, but 
that makes doing surveys not always the most fun. I drink a lot of water uh, during my surveys and try to stay cool. And sometimes like I'm in my hip waders because I got to get in and out of the creek and walk in someplace. And then by the time I get back to my truck, I'm just like soaked underneath my waders. But I wouldn't have it any other. Well, I may have it like air conditioned way. That would be nice if I could just like count them like that. That'd be easy. In an air conditioned building. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So, um, so yeah, when it's really hot and really sunny, that's when I know the tiger beetles are going to be out. It, and honestly, if it gets cloudy, they, they just aren't out as much. Um, their numbers will be down by at least a half, if not three quarters. Huh. That's why are they so dependent on that sun? Like, I don't know. You know, okay. they, um, it's, it's one of their life strategies. I think that when it's sunny, they're out and about, um, maybe it's just because other species are then hidden. Aren't? So and they yeah, they don't that have niche that competition. Or... Yeah. Huh. So, um, but we know when it's nice, bright, sunny and warm, that's when we got to get out and go count them. So like when I first started counting them, we had, um, I had one day, then we got a bunch of rain and little salt Creek was pretty high and actually was covering a lot of the mud flats that the Salt Creek tiger beetle used. So I had to wait um, for everything to warm up and dry out, and then I can go back out again. And today was a pretty good day. So when you count them, I just imagine oh, yeah. in my head that you're like standing over them and see all these little beetles washing around, wandering around. How do you like, I don't know, how do you not lose count? Like one goes yeah. out of bush, one comes back out. Like how do, I don't know. So when you're doing estimates on insects, there's a couple of different ways to do it. With a lot of insects, you can use like a kill trap and that gives you an estimate of abundance in an area. Obviously for an endangered species, we don't wanna kill them. Uh, we don't even wanna impact them uh, at all possible. So another way, that you count insects a lot of times is you put up a, a UV light at night and that draws them all in. I mean, it's, it's like this huge beacon that they all just go to and you can just sit there and count however many. If you do that though, you're pulling the tiger beetles away from their habitat. You're impacting you're also, them, yeah. Yeah, you're impacting them. You're also potentially drawing in predators and other things. So we don't want to do that either. So the last method is, like you said, I'm literally walking along and I've got a clicker and that counts <laughs> in my hand. And I just kind of click as I go. And I, there's pictures of me doing this. I look kind of ridiculous, but I'm actually kind of pointing the ones I've counted and trying to keep a line of, okay, I've counted that one. You know, if I see anything else move over here, you know, cause I kind of have to wait for them to move to really zone in on them. And then I can count them. And that's basically it. Usually I'll walk by an area two or three times just to try to get the count as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. We know we're not counting all of them. I'm sure I'm missing some, but um, that's kind of the trade-off of not impacting them uh, as much yeah. as possible. So that's what we do. And, and we use those estimates and Steve Spomer started that. And uh, we just published a paper not too long ago on 30 years of wow. visual estimates of Salt Creek tiger beetles. I've been a, a part of that just for the last couple of years. Steve really did that uh, with him and, and uh, my previous um, predecessor, Mike Fritz. Um, they did a lot of that work, but I'm so excited to be carrying it on from here. You know, it's funny that you say, I know we're not counting all of them. And I feel like when I was in school, one of my professors, um, we were doing like surveys of box turtles and he called it um, a swags and wags. Um, so like wild ass guesses and then you have scientific wild ass guesses. So mm -hmm. like, um, I don't know, that's always kind of stuck with me because I know that we're not getting every single one of them, but it's being as scientifically accurate as we possibly can be at the time, so. Right, and especially if you're doing the same thing and the, by the same methods year after year after year, yes. it makes those numbers very comparable. So there, there is some precedent for doing that and being like, okay, I know we're not getting all of them, but we're doing it the same way every year. And we can kind of see a trend then when we have more beetles or when we have less. Um, so 
we we're going to kind of move on now to um, talking about like the why section of our program. So why is this so sure. important? And I know you've touched on this a little bit about it, but something that we always like to ask people is in their kind of respective fields. If there was a world without invertebrates, <gasps> <laughs> what would that look like for us or for wow. other animals? How would that impact our world if there were no invertebrates? And I know that's again, 95% of our species on earth. That oh would my gosh. Like it's, it's, it boggles my mind. It's like trying to think of like how space is infinite, but expanding, <laughs> like it's, it's so, okay. Let's start with like, you know, we've been talking about muscles. So uh, muscles are filter feeders, right? So a lot of the water goes through these muscles. They filter things out, um, you know, all of that, what we call ecosystem services. So things that uh, native species do for humans and for the environment, a lot of that filter feeding would be gone. So that, that wouldn't happen. Um, all of the little things that you see in water, the mosquito larvae, the uh, dobson flies, the, um, you know, uh, odonates, um, dragonflies, damselflies, all those larvae that fishy would be gone. You know, those things are gone. So fish food is going to be way, way down. Your fish would probably die. If we move to land, oh my goodness, all our invertebrates are gone. So all of our pollinators are gone. All of our invertebrate pollinators are our vertebrates, I know. Um, but our spiders. Not, their spiders are gone. I think most people would be happy about that. But honestly, spiders eat a lot of the other insects that bother people. You know, they catch mosquitoes in their, in their webs and eat those. Those are all gone. So, um, oh my gosh, birds, birds eat a ton of insects. Uh, possums eat a lot of ticks, which are not insects. They're arachnids. They're in the, the spider group, if you will. Um, all of that's gone. So, a lot of your smaller mammals that eat invertebrates, insects, are likely don't have food source anymore. Birds, are a bats. lot of birds, are, bats are not like, Oh my gosh, it just anymore. is, yeah, like you said, it's every single thing. It's it, not just like, okay, we probably have birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that yeah. whole, yeah. again, that food chain, that food web, this is a great example of it. Worms, all of your soil, we didn't even go into soil macroinvertebrates. I mean, I like, so, like worms and everything that are, eating the soil, turning the soil over, all of those are gone. Oh my gosh, your soil would just rot and be useless. So I, yeah, it would be really hard to, to accurately talk about it, but basically your trophic levels would just start collapsing and everything would die. So they're just a little important is what I got out of that. Yeah. Just a little. Yeah, just a okay. little. I've right. never had anyone ask like, what would happen if we had just no invertebrates? That's like, it, it's almost terrifying to me. So. Yeah, I mean, you just don't really understand the collapse of things yeah. um, that we wouldn't have. And I think a lot of people, you know, think about the June bugs that hit you in the face when you go outside right. or <laughs> the annoying mosquitoes or they see yeah. the, the, the bad or the, what they consider a bad insect, but they're, there's not really a good and bad. It's just, maybe a pest or a nuisance to us, sure. but those bad insects are so important for things. Like you said, our small mammals, our birds. And we, like you said, we even mentioned the soil tonight or anything, yeah. like that, but I mean, oh my gosh, there's so many things that, that live in soil, not, you know, everything from, you know, bacteria and nematodes to worms. And, you know, there, I know we're not supposed to talk about them, but even like, you know, vertebrates that are burrowing under in the soil. I mean, all sorts of cool stuff. American burying beetles, you know, some of our uh, uh, things that help get rid of dead stuff, you know, so many things that, that are in the soil we didn't even have a chance to talk about. We know a whole other um, like soil ver invertebrate <sighs> nature nerd night. Nature nerd night soil. And we just talked about for 2023. We have a list of already of 2023. Okay. Okay. Topics. So Stay we'll tuned, that. everybody on here. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> we'll add that. <laughs> um, so on top of that, I know we talked a little bit about iNaturalists and ways that people mm -hmm. can get involved, but um, why should Nebraskans really care about our invertebrate diversity? I know you mentioned like there, if we didn't have any, that it would collapse. Um, but why should like a Nebraskan 
care about our, our invertebrates? You know, there's, I'll try to, I'll try to answer this from a different couple different perspectives based on what most people might be interested in. You know, if, if you care at all about the outdoors, if you care at all about, you know, fruits and vegetables, honey, you know, any of those, you're going to want insects, even the annoying ones. You know, most people have been stung by bees, honeybees. Um, obviously, they're a source of honey for us. Um, you know, again, pollinators are, you know, a lot of the butterflies, they're beautiful. They come through, they, they pollinate flowers. Um, they're also really cool to look at. These things are also a lot of food for a lot of our species, birds, bats, like small mammals, all of those things that are a really integral part of our ecosystem of Nebraska. And what's really cool is that we have a lot of species here in Nebraska that aren't found anywhere else. You know, we've got the Salt Creek tiger beetle. We've got the American bearing beetle, which is found other places, but its stronghold is really in Nebraska. And other states come to Nebraska to get some of our American bearing beetles, take them back to their state to help repopulate their state. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons depending on what your interests are, but if you have any interest in the outdoors, there's gonna be an insect that is, is beneficial for something you do care about. And um, again, get into insects. There's so many cool ones to, to learn about. I think one of the reasons that I did not take entomology is because you had to take care of a cockroach for a semester. Mm. Um, okay. I just remember one of my friends kept it in their house and every time I went over there, they'd have to <laughs> feed it. And like, I just, I don't know, not many things like, uh, but like, man. Oh yeah. Well, I understand, you know, my, my daughters brought in one time uh, a cicada and they were very worried about it because it wasn't moving much. So we had to figure out how are we going to care for the cicada. Cicadas drink tree sap mainly. So we took a paper towel and soaked up uh, just a tiny piece of paper towel, soaked up some maple syrup with that, put it in there with some leaves and everything. It started drinking that. It got a little more active. And then we had a conversation about how it's not a pet and we got to let it go. And so we let it go. But my kids were really excited. But that was a good opportunity to say, you know, most of their friends at school were really scared of, of cicadas and didn't like to, to touch them or anything. But, you know, both my girls will go up, they will pick up just about any insect and tell their friends about it. And I think that's awesome. You know, even if it was an insect, if it was just about anything else, you know, I love it when, you know, our, our kids and our youth are interested in that and I want to keep them on that pathway. I like how most people would say, you know, we found a, a squirrel or a bunny and you're mm -hmm. like, we found a cicada and put it in a, yeah. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> My daughter yeah. was playing soccer um, this last week and they were talking, they were playing a game where they have to kick the ball and, and hit the, the teacher or the coach's feet and they would sting them. So at the oh. beginning, you know, the coach was like, who knows what a bumblebee is? And my kid is three, she raises her hand and they're like, what do bumblebees do? And one and at the same time, um, this one kid goes sting, and my kid goes pollinate. And I was like, yeah, yeah they do <laughs> pollinate. So it was a proud uh, moment. I understand about the cicada stuff. So absolutely, my so my oldest, she was really interested. So another project we have going on right now is the Nebraska uh, bumblebee atlas that people can get involved in. They can identify uh, bumblebees and send those in to be uh, confirmed, their identification confirmed. And then it gives us a good idea about our bumblebee uh, populations. So uh, when that started a couple of years ago, we were doing some uh, identification in our front yard. And I, my daughter was pretty scared because it looks like a honeybee, but bigger. And so it's a little bit more intimidating. But one thing about bumblebees is that they're, they're fairly laid back. And so yeah. I taught her that you know, as long as you're being gentle, you can actually pet bumblebees while they're getting nectar and pollen out and everything. So now that's like one of her favorite things to do is look for bumblebees to pet. And so that's just how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I have a couple other questions. So usually about the last like five, three, four, five minutes or so of our Nature Nerd Night, we do lightning round um, okay. from questions from our audience. So we only had a couple tonight, um, but one of them I really wanted to ask you, Sean, because they were, it was very interesting. What invertebrate would you associate yourself with? Oh boy. Um, mm, that, how much time do I have? You said lightning round. This isn't fair. Uh, <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Salt Creek tiger beetle. You know, okay. it's, I spend a lot of time watching them. So maybe that's the problem, but they're not always very graceful. Like when they fly, they get up and they usually like fly into vegetation. Um, I tend to not be as graceful. Um, also they're um, pretty, like when they're eating, they get pretty excited. They just like throw their face into the soil and they get a drink or they look for little, um, little things to eat in the soil. And um, I think sometimes the way I eat, my wife gives me a look like, you know, what are you doing? You're sticking your face in that. So I think that's, I think that would be something I would identify with. Okay. I'll give you that. Salt Creek Tiger Beetle. Um, and then someone else also mentioned, um, why do bugs fly in your face? I think we've all had yeah. a, like beeline literally right to our face. Why is that? Yeah. So it, um, it depends on what kind it is. Beetles. A lot of times we notice beetles flying in our face. Beetles are, most beetles, not all, most beetles are not the most graceful flyers. That's because they have those elytra over their wings and they've got to flip those things up. Then they got to unfurl their wings. They got to fly. Then they're flying with those elytra out. And those things can get kind of heavy. They're like giant rudders and they just kind of like go off to the side. So beetles have that excuse that they're just not graceful flyers. Other times, if uh, insects like are in a swarm, they're all just kind of going one direction for some reason, and maybe you're just in their way. Um, also, uh, sometimes they're just um, going to you because you smell good. Like, so it's a compliment have, if they fly. Yeah, it could you. be like a compliment, or you've got sweat on you, and they're like, oh, we're going to come drink that, and they want to come drink it, and they're, they're just trying to help clean you up you know? Okay. So yeah, I mean, there are some benefits to that. All right. Well, good to know. I don't feel as bad because, you know, we always see the <laughs> cartoons where like the stinky kid has the flies floating above uh -huh. his head in the cartoons. So I feel better, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Um, we had a couple of people who had some questions from the chat. Um, someone yeah. asked, um, do bumblebee pictures need to be sent somewhere special or are they pulled off the general iNaturalist observations? So there is um, a specific website for the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, and it walks you through, I think there is a separate app uh, that they have or a website that you can download them to. I haven't looked at it recently, but um, can you send out the link for that, Monica? Yes, I was trying okay. to find it on here. I don't know if I can... Uh if it'll load here, but yes, I can certainly put it in the chat really fast. And then I will send um, some more information about that um, in our evaluation when we send it out, um, maybe tomorrow or maybe on uh, Thursday. So just go ahead and watch for that. Yeah, that, then, it's a really cool project. So everybody really look at that because there's a lot of cool stuff going on with, with the data they've collected. Yeah, and there's trainings that you can do as well to become more familiar with your species and mm -hmm. um, on how to set up a grid and all of that stuff. Yeah. And then someone else also asked how many bee species reside in Nebraska? I know we have around 20 bumblebees, but I'm yeah. not as sure about in general how many bees. Yeah, so our native bees, um, okay, so you've got the honeybee, which is not a native, it's a uh, European It's a cow with wings. Here. Yeah. What, yeah, basically. Yeah. So then we've got our bumblebees, uh, which as Monica noted, we've got about 20 or so. Then we've got our, um, there's a couple of different groups, but bees in general, what we call like our solitary bees. And there's a few others that aren't solitary, but native um, hundreds, I would say, um, that we know of. I would say maybe 270 to 320 ballpark. That's my swag, by the way. So that, that's what I would go with. Someone's, 
you know, someone's probably going to go on there and be like, no, there's, there's probably more like 1200. Thank you very much. So, but that's what I would guess just based on, on some things I've seen, but I could be completely wrong, but very easily into the hundreds. Awesome. Well, and I can figure out that too, and um, actually send that information because we have someone that's um, working really closely with that bumblebee atlas or our pollinator ecologist as well. I can maybe ask. Yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have tonight and um, it is 802. So I want to make sure that people are getting home and getting to do what they want to do tonight. And Sean, thank you so much for joining yeah. us tonight. We really appreciate it. You um, have been some great insight into the world of invertebrates. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you being on tonight. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to talk about invertebrates anytime. And we will let you know when we do the invertebrate soil version. <sighs> So you can either just watch it or be a part of it. It's up to you. So <laughs> I'm going to, I just want to be a part of it. I, I, I don't know if I'd have much to add to that one, but oh my gosh, I could learn so much. Be very interesting. I agree. Yeah. Um, all right. So like everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. We will be sending out a um, evaluation, um, not only to fill out about how much you enjoyed this, but also with some resources and to help you, um, register for our next Nebraska Nature Nerd Night, which will be July 19th. It's a Tuesday, um, just like our normal Nature Nerd Nights. And this one, we're going to go back to vertebrates. And we're going to be talking a little bit about our fish diversity, our freshwater fish diversity that we have here in Nebraska. Um, so we'll have some fisheries biologists on. We're going to have our aquatic invasive species person on. Um, so it will be a a good scaly time. I don't know. I tried. So um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Again, thank you very much, Sean. We appreciate you guys coming out tonight. I know it's summer and it's a nice night out. So we appreciate you being online and learning some stuff from us. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone.